for session one, um, we're looking at promoting the child parent relationship through a partnership model in Ireland. And the three presenters are Teresa Byrne, the assistant governor of Limerick Prison in Ireland, Bernie O'Grady of Bedford Row, who's a COPE member, the organization, and Damien Landy of Tuzla, which is the statutory child and family agency in Ireland. So over to you, Teresa, for your presentation. Hello, everybody. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Yes, thank yes. you. Yes, okay. My name is Teresa Byrne, and I'm Assistant Governor here in Limerick Prison, Ireland. So we're delighted with the opportunity today uh, to be given the chance for this presentation. And I'm along here with my two colleagues, Bernie and Damien. So just uh, the title of the uh, program was Through the Eyes of a Child, and it's how agencies can work together to achieve a common goal and our common goal was what a child sees when they come into prison to visit their parent and a lot of the children we're, we'll be talking about are children in care and um, so it was entitled through the eyes of a child and um, Limerick prison Bedford Row family project and the Tusla um, family agency how did it come about well we were involved with the Irish Human Rights Equality Commission in, towards the end of 2017 a working group was set up and that working group was looking at uh, female prisoners and through the lens of what they see of what Irish human rights mean uh, to them. Uh, out of the working group one of the projects that they were very uh, strongly advocate for was the family room that was already in Limerick prison. Uh, that family room was a uh, at the time you know it served a purpose but you know you have to move with the times and for children coming in uh, to visit their parent into that type of room it was very bland and um, masculine colors uh, the children's toys not really applicable to the different age groups that hadn't been changed that type of thing so what we did was we looked at the room itself and we also looked at the very front of the um, uh, building so what we decided number one was to change uh, the name from family visits room uh, and entitle it the sitting room because what do you do in your sitting room you go into the room you go to relax if you have company you're going to uh, engage in dialogue and positive conversation and that's what we wanted the children to do so in the room we kind of divided into two areas one was where the adults uh, which would be namely the maybe the social worker and the parent could have that type of a conversation that needed to be had and then at the other end was where the children would play and the interaction then between the two different areas and you will see pictures later on of what that room looks like and um, from uh, the project initiation uh, we've had about 800 children come through the um, prison uh, with about 68 of them in um, in, in Tusla related. So as you can see from the pictures here, um, any prison walls, dark, grey, depressing. And we're, the type, we're a prison that's in the middle of a, a community here in Limerick. We're in the inner city of uh, Limerick in Ireland. Uh, we've currently 214 prisoners um, in the prison and out of them we'd have about 23 females here today. Now, as you can see from the objects of art at the front of the prison, uh, we did um, the three 
persons there are representative of the mother, the father and the child, because we're unique here in Ireland in, in Limerick, where we have a male and a female prison under the one roof. So those uh, three persons are replicates of really of what the prison is all about. And as you can see, there's a little plaque there, which was called the divided self. And it was um, the Irish Human Rights Commissioner, uh, Teresa Blake, launched that uh, design in honour of the work that was done with the Irish Human Rights Commission. Also, we uh, put art features there in conjunction with our education department in the uh, school and benches. So when children are coming up, you know, they see this artwork. We've artwork all around the prison when we have an art college across the road that actually um, send students over to uh, draw and take pictures of the artwork. So when children are coming up, uh, maybe for the first time to visit their mother and father, they're struck by the artwork and it's a talking point before they come into the prison. Uh, at there, you can see is where the two rooms, uh, they're the visits, so what a typical visits room looks like in a prison, long benches, uh, round tables, but you can imagine children coming in care uh, coming in to visit their parent, whether they're male or female, and seeing, you know, trying to have that conversation uh, and um, prison officers standing there. And there was other visits going on. So it was really, really to have that dedicated room for the children, for them to have uh, engage with their parent, and also to kind of maybe bring the social worker in and have that uh, very easygoing conversation. So, you know, we were delighted to be involved with Bedford Row and uh, with Tusla coming involved uh, and getting this award of investing in children because we're the first prison uh, to have that type of award. And it has been challenging um, because once you receive award, you can't just leave it there. You have to continue on with the work that needs to be done. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to hand you over to Bernie uh, from Bedford Row and she's going to go through the next part of the project. So thank you very much uh, for taking the time to listen today. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, so I'm Bernie O'Grady. I'm the social worker with the Bedford Row Family Project here in Limerick City. And I work uh, with the women who are in custody in Limerick Prison and I work with them when they're released into the community. So as uh, Teresa Assistant Governor outlined that in 2008 we received uh, the Investing in Children Award for the opening of our sitting room here in Limerick Prison. And um, in 2019 we had 68 TUSLA related visits here in the sitting room uh, devised through a case by case basis. So they would all be, those 68 visits would all be in relation to children who were in the care of the state here in Ireland. We would have other visits outside of that, but they're the specific Tusla ones for which I am the Lincoln liaison person. All of the visits are, are pre-planned in terms of me working with the women supporting them prior to the visit. I'm on the visit to support and there's um, feedback afterwards and learning from mum uh, about the visit and equally uh, communication and consultation with the social work. And just to give you some, an example of maybe a, a kind of a scenario in it, we had a lady in custody whose uh, child was in care and Tusla were um, applying for an 18 year care order that the state would become the carer and responsible carer for her child until the child turned 18. But mum had a, it was very chaotic prior to her custody but when she was in custody things settled down and she was making excellent progress in terms of her, her addiction, her counselling, her education and in terms of her work with me around her parenting role. And Tusla became engaged with us in this and the social worker responsible for the child came to visit mom and we had a long meeting. And due to, I suppose, what she heard and what she's seen in the mom, they, Tusla agreed to reduce the, the care order and they applied for a two year care order, which was really significant for the mom to give her a chance to, I suppose, to work on her, what she was working on herself emotionally and her plans and to see how release would be for her. Now, part of that two-year care order was a kind of a reintroduction of her child with her again. She hadn't seen her for quite a while uh, in terms of the chaos in her life prior to custody. So the child, that began in the sitting room here in Limerick Prison, and it, it built up to monthly visits uh, where I was present, the social worker was present, um, and it made a big difference to the, to the child and to the mother. 
and we have a little quote up here. These are little quotes that children give us in relation to their experience of the sitting room. But this specific one, I made tea to go with my birthday cake. That was the little quote from that little girl who celebrated her fourth birthday in the sitting room. And we were able to have cake and candles and balloons. And it was really positive for that child and, and for mom in that situation. So that's just an example of what happens in the sitting room. There are lots of other examples, but kind of time constraints uh, don't allow this space for it. But, um, just give you a little flavor of some of the quotes the children here you can see the sitting room so i'm just kind of circling there the the more adult space where people can sit and talk we have an inspiration wall here where one of the women uh, who's in custody types of positive affirmations that we change regularly on the wall and this is just a great talking point uh, this other side of the room is the play area so a little toy kitchen there and play materials and a sink and different bits and pieces here. So again, some quotes there from children about their experience of the sitting room just being like grannies. And that's the sense we've tried to create. I like it here. I can talk to Mammy and play with her. Uh, I suppose we've had very strong links with Tusla and I suppose just some of their feedback on the experience of uh, the sitting room. So it makes a scary situation a lot less scary for the child, a social worker says. Second social worker talks about children being made to feel relaxed, going through the main gate, through the security, into the sitting room and playing with the toys and having their questions answered is a key part of how we would work around uh, the child and the mother. Another social worker talks about the room allowing the child to see clearly and move freely between the seating area and the toy and play area. And there are toys in the room which make it very appropriate for the child and the mother to have imaginative play. Um, there's only one visit happening at any time in the sitting room. And this gives privacy and a space for the child to explore the environment with her mother. And I suppose all the time enhancing that relationship. And we're very key on that emotional attachment between parent and child. Uh, so I suppose all of the work that um, is done with the mums is grounded in my own training in social work and I'm also a trained parenting under pressure therapist and the parenting under pressure program is designed specifically to work with complex families in improving better outcomes for children and that's a key part of my training and a key part of the work that I do and um, the parenting under pressure integrated theoretical framework is there on the screen and it's kind of looking at child's developmental outcomes so how is the child developing in these areas and what are the influences coming from the ecological model here of attachment and emotional availability, uh, parental values, how is the parent managing their emotions, emotional regulation of the parent, and then the connection to community, what's going on in the wider community that's influencing the child's developmental outcomes. So that would be the, the theoretical basis from which you'd be working with, with the moms in custody. And I suppose in receiving the award, uh, we wanted to embed this work further in Limerick Prison um, uh, uh, for both women and their children. And we worked, I've, a colleague of mine is a psychotherapist in the project. So through his uh, psychotherapy, specifically focusing on um, emotional intelligence and self-awareness and my own work with POP, we designed a program called Through the Eyes of a Child uh, Project. And this is a 10 week program just coming up on your screen there. And key in this program was the use of our PUP, Parenting Under Pressure program and the psychotherapy. But we were also going bringing in the members of our multidisciplinary team to deliver the modules with us. So bringing in their expertise from people like the prison education department, our psychologist, rape crisis center who offers counseling here in the prison, um, our addiction counsellors, our healthcare team and our probation services. So they were the people who were going to be feeding into the delivery of the modules with us here in, with the women. Uh, another key module and this was the voice of the child and my colleague and myself met with 14 children uh, and it had an interview and a session with them around their whole experience of visiting a parent in custody right from the very beginning of who told them their parent was in custody and how they heard uh, right up to the visits and their whole experience of it and equally what what might help for them in terms of of the experience of imprisonment and um, linked with this we had Tusla social worker coming in also bringing in that aspect of their role in the care of children so this is this is our 10-week program due to COVID-19 we got to deliver six weeks of the program 
So we have six weeks of it delivered and presently we're looking at how to conclude that meaningfully for the women who participated. Some have been released into the community. So that's one piece of it. The second piece is looking at evaluating how it has gone so far and forward planning into the future. So at this uh, stage, I'd like to hand you over to Damien Landy from Tusla. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Um, as Bernie says, my name is Damien, Damien Landy. Um, I'm with TUSLA, which is the Child and Family Agency in Ireland with statutory responsibility around child protection. So you would have heard about social work. Um, my own particular role involves uh, prevention, partnership and family support. And I suppose a focus would be on early intervention. So services that TUSLA would work in partnership include the likes of Bedford Row, who uh, endeavor to engage with families, children, young people at an early stage in terms of the onset maybe of a challenge or a problem, and also early in terms of the life of a young person. Um, so uh, TUSLA, uh, has commissioned the Investing in Children Award. It's uh, a UK foundation. Um, if you want to maybe have a Google on that later. And the Investing in Children Award is about participation of young people, but specifically about uh, listening to their voice and then uh, implementing change. So dialogue to change. And numerous organizations i suppose traditionally in ireland maybe community development youth work have pursued uh, an investing in children award it might sit with their their core business um but i was very excited to be involved with bedford row and limerick prison as Teresa mentioned earlier uh, the investing in children award in a prison is a new ground for for that award for tusla uh, so we we a common approach there and that we are all kind of a little bit outside our comfort zone in terms of um, looking at uh, this award and the voice of the child in what is primarily an adult setting. Um, so I suppose what, what it demonstrates is that the project, while well, organizations were, were coming from very different backgrounds, maybe, as I said, traditionally early intervention services, family support services to come into the prison, but I suppose when you work together, we can look at that common focus on uh, improving children's lives. So the, the work that was going on, the context that Teresa set there around um, the, uh, the human rights approach, it kind of created an opportunity for us to collaborate. Uh, the social work involvement would have been a trigger for that. You have social workers organizing access visits and they were very impressed, I suppose, with how Limerick Prison was looking at the, the whole experience of children and how to facilitate that in a, in a child-centered way. Um, so um, in terms of um, our role in that, we kind of worked together. We achieved the award, um, shared the learning with our, with our colleagues. Um, TUSLA, while it is a statutory service with social workers involved, as I said, the prevention element uh, and uh, the part of the, the partnership that focuses on working closely with to funding arrangements, uh, services in the community. Um, so that was kind of the magic ingredient was bringing a community based service together, uh, working with the statutory child protection service, along with the statutory prison service uh, and bringing those partners together. Uh, that was the magic ingredient, I feel, in terms of uh, bringing different uh, expertises to the table and then that collaboration. Um, as Bernie mentioned, uh, the dreaded COVID-19 has arrived and that's um, changed obviously the context in which uh, the work is delivered and how agencies have to work together. Um, but I suppose the, the sitting room um, was there and established and allowed social workers to continue to engage with Limerick Prison and Bedford Row to facilitate that connection to video calls. So doing it in a safe way with the video calls, but also um, 
ensuring that uh, while visits stopped, that that connection, that emotional connection to a certain degree could be maintained. And what we're looking at now in terms of both sustaining the award and building upon the learning is uh, a pilot project, uh, the Living Well You and Me project. And what we envisage happening here is, um, I suppose, being able to work in the current context, maybe remotely, but post COVID as well, is having, uh, we're, we're developing a, a workbook uh, where the parent and the child have shared activities that they can reflect before uh, coming together, maybe online or hopefully not too far away in the future, meet again um, when we have some of these restrictions removed. Uh, so that's the pilot project that we're looking at all the time, thinking about how you know, listening to the voice of the child and how that can inform uh, service design and delivery. So, um, as I said, I think the key thing has been the collaboration and how we've learned from each other. I would have had my models of youth participation in mind, but would have been clueless as to the challenges of delivering that in a prison environment. And then with the expertise of Bedford Row being a family support project in the community, uh, that trust and relationship there to be able to, to facilitate both parents and children's voices uh, informing our decisions was very powerful, I feel. Okay. So we've just a couple of pictures there at the end of uh, receiving the award, but it's nice to get the award and to display it, but as as Teresa uh, has outlined, it's about continuous, ongoing, sustaining that award. So that's the, the vision for the future uh, within the service and how we'll work together how to sustain it. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much indeed to our three presenters. Um, you probably haven't been able to see, but the chat has actually been quite active uh, which shows how much interest and stimulation you've given. Anyone else, don't forget, if you've got questions or comments, do put them into that, that chat, chat function. And we're now going to move to the second session on making protect, protected non-contact visits child-friendly. And it'll be chaired by Vivian Schechter of Repair, Switzerland. But we'll start with a short video. Everything I want to tell him. But then we start talking and it gets easier. Daddy says how proud he is of us for helping mom at home and for all the things we're learning. So I, I think there was no sound here for most of us. Um, are you, Brianna, going to put this back on so we have it all with the sound? Is, is this possible?
There's no sound for the moment. That's technology. We're having good challenges here. I think we don't have sound at all. No. Oh, no sound. Oh. It has been working at the end of it. Mom reminds us about the rules at the stress. Yeah, it's worked. That's it. Good. <laughs> All right, try to figure out. This is my favorite picture of me and my daddy. He used to take me to the park all the time, but he can't right now because my daddy's in prison. Today we're going to visit him. Me and my mom and my little brother Michael are going to take a bus. On the way, mom reminds us about the rules of this prison. We can talk to daddy and see him, but we're not allowed to touch him. I just can't wait to see him already. The walls are tall at the prison, with lots of gates and wires everywhere. I hold Mom's hand a little tighter as we walk in, and she lets me know it's okay. Sometimes, we have to wait online a long time before we can see my daddy. We pass through loud gates that open and close behind us. Then we go into another room where we have to wait again. Finally, my daddy comes in. His hair is a little longer than last time. It's good to see him. At first I forget everything I want to tell him, but then we start talking and it gets easier. Daddy says how proud he is of us for helping mom at home and for all the things we're learning. It's hard not to be able to touch or hug each other but daddy blows me a kiss. I tell him I'll save it for later. Before we know it, it's time to go already. I don't want to say goodbye. I wish daddy could come with us, but this is where he has to be because he broke a law. But we all look forward to the next time we can come and visit again. As we take the bus back home, I think about daddy going back to what he does in prison. And I know he'll be thinking about me, just like I'm thinking about him. Okay, thank you for the video and thanks, Brianna, for all the technical means. You have the link here if you want to keep this video or show it to others. Um, I'm happy to be with you today and, and share this uh, second session. Um, it's very emotional, this, um, this tiny video. I think uh, for many of us, it's our everyday job to see those emotions, but probably not for all. So it, it's really nice to see this. And I think particularly, it's important to remember all the time that we are chatting, we are having research, theory, we're trying to build up some actions, but all of this is directly linked to real children and real situation. And it's just um, absolutely necessary to keep this emotion because this helps us to go all through this um, uh, wonderful process of putting ideas together. We're currently living a very ex exceptional period with this uh, prevention of coronavirus. And I think Many of us had made a lot of changes in their private lives and also, of course, in prisons. Many of us has experienced in this period being away from some of our loved ones, not being able to take care with a hug, uh, having troubles to have some news, making sure grandchildren are okay, or grandparents or parents. Of course, it's only a small bit of what families of prisoners experience. But I think we can be in touch a little bit with this feeling of seeing only on a screen or having to make a WhatsApp or something to have some news and being able to adapt all our usual ways of communicating. 
And this is what is facing our um, families and our children there. Um, most of our prisons services have implemented measures and um, policies to facilitate or physical visits with special measures or alternative means of contact. Some of them have kept visits, but what is really a child-friendly visit? And this is the main question we are getting to this afternoon. And who evaluates what is a friendly visit? Because being next to a glass window or being on a Skype, is this enough to say, yeah, I tick the box, it's child-friendly because they had a Skype? Here in Geneva, Luca just said it was so great to have a Skype with his father because his father was in his room and he was able to show him how it was at home and said dad was at home for the first time for years. But for Jane, a little girl in Lausanne, in Switzerland, she was so frightened and is still coping with this because her dad appeared at home with this Skype and she felt before that this was the safe place at home because dad has been really violent at some point. So this was much too hard for her. On the same level, we had a little friend here who told me yesterday it was so great, the glass visit. After eight weeks without a visit, it was great to see each other and laugh together. But for her smaller sister, she cried all visit long. So what is really child friendly? Where is the best interest of the child? I think the most in important thing is, not, uh, is to never forget nothing about me without me. If you don't talk to children, you mustn't decide anything without having their opinion or making sure you can have part of their opinion. Because in every family, every situation, it, is, it can be very different. We have this afternoon this, the opportunity of sharing experiences, challenges, and point of views with four great professionals. Bente, Athena, Nuria, and Anne will pinpoint challenges and good practice examples they have in their field. Um, at the end, we will have some time in small groups to discuss further on and to engage in those questions. Um, but for the moment, I think we're on time. As you see, I put on my cuckoo clock and that will be <laughs> my job. I will be the timekeeper because we have here some challenge, keeping the time, a very short but very focused time. So, have all a very interesting sessions with all of us, and let's get started. I want to introduce first for you Bente Grambo. She's a senior counselor at FFP in Norway. Uh, they provide advocacy, training, and support for relatives and friends of prisoners. And most of the time, we have to say, our friends in Norway look for us as really good examples. Um, Bente, the field is for you and the Zoom is yours and uh, you can talk with us about the reactions of children and families. Thank you Vivian, I'll just uh, share the screen now. Um, can you see it? Yes, perfect. Okay. Um, yes, as uh, most of you with the coronavirus, um, we also in Norway have had uh, no physical visits uh, since uh, the middle of March, uh, but video visits uh, was very quickly established um, already by March 27th or 28th, the guidelines uh, were uh, ready. Uh, and uh, some prisons have taken a little bit of time to sort of get it up and running, but uh, the willingness from the authorities was there almost immediately, which has been very good. Um, the video visits are free of charge and every prisoner also have uh, extended phone time, and this is also free of charge. 
Um, and now we are gradually reopening uh, the prisons uh, and the authorities are being quite specific that this uh, should really happen. So the prisons should really have a good reason not to um, allow families to come to visit again. Uh, it's a really big gap between the normal visits in Norway and these uh, restricted uh, visits. Because a normal visit with us, there's no limitations when it comes to physical contact. Um, uh, children, they don't visit with glass partition. That's sort of an unwritten rule. A child should never visit the parent with that kind of a barrier. And in most prisons, there are private visiting areas for each family. So you sort of meet the prison staff when you enter the prison and when you go home again. Uh, and other, other than that, you are sort of private. Uh, and now the families are being offered protected visits with glass partition or with uh, prison staff present during the visit to make sure that there's no physical contact. So the difference is quite big in Norway. And this time has been really sort of chaotic and challenging for prisons. Uh, we have a lot of different prisons from small ones for, with 12 prisoners to big ones in the Norwegian scale of sort of 250, 300 prisoners. Um, and some prisons have started uh, visits now. Um, and uh, their experience uh, from just the last week uh, who have uh, had children visiting is that uh, children, especially small children, they don't follow the rules when it comes to social distancing. Of course they don't. So they have run into their parents' lap and had a hug. And the sort of uh, unofficial policy uh, in the prisons have been that the prison officer have not intervened and separated the child from the parent. They, they talk to the families beforehand to sort of tell them what the rules are and then they have a talk afterwards but they don't go in and separate the, the child from the parent. Uh, I think uh, we have quite a low spread of the coronavirus in Norway now, so that's probably part of the reason that they are able so, to be so flexible, but it's, it's really good that they are, I think. And then there's the question, uh, if it's child-friendly, uh, and of course it isn't child friendly with all these uh, barriers. Uh, but maybe something can be child friendly enough and there's a bit of a discussion on who decides whether or not it is. Uh, some prisons say that we won't allow visits at all and especially not uh, children visiting because we are not able to make them uh, child friendly enough. Uh, but we think that that should be up to the families uh, themselves, really. Uh, they, children have individual needs. Uh, you have to look at their age, what they are able to cope with. For some children, it might be more harmful not to see the parent than uh, to sort of have a visit with restrictions. So we, we think that the prison should do their sort of utmost to um, make sure that it's so uh, child-friendly as possible and let the families uh, really know uh, what uh, the visit will entail so they can sort of prepare for it. But then it should be up to the families uh, and the children themselves uh, if they want to go and see their parent in prison. But the families we are in contact with, we have had a lot of calls from families uh, the last couple of months. They don't want to visit under these circumstances. They're used to private visits without prison officers sort of uh, looking at them. They think it's uh, intimidating. They really don't want to uh, visit uh, until it's sort of back to normal again. Uh, and the video visits uh, are working very well. Uh, and they say that we will rather carry on with the video visits instead. Uh, and we had a quite a few calls from prisoners as well um, who sort of want to discuss whether or not we think it's uh, child friendly for them to have the children coming to see them. And they, they sort of share the rest of the family's view. They, they don't want the children to come. 
uh, they want to carry on with um, video visits because uh, it's working very well. I think both families, uh, prisoners and prisons think that um, the video visits are working very well. Uh, and here in Norway, we have strong signals now that uh, this will carry on after the coronavirus, uh, in addition to physical visits, because it sort of offers an um, extra platform for family contact. It's more flexible, but it, it cannot replace uh, a physical visit, of course. Um, we had a few years ago an expert group with children who experienced that their parents um, uh, were sent out of the country after serving their sentence uh, and one of the girls there said that uh, the problem with the computer is that it doesn't have arms and I, I think that sort of applies for the situation we are in now as well so uh, the video visits are good but it, it cannot replace the physical visits yes thank you thank you Bente that gives us really a good feeling of, of this um, balance we have to do. And I'm happy to introduce you Athena Demetriou, who is our friend from Cyprus. And it's really inter interesting to follow up with uh, the point of view of Athena because she's a deputy governor of Cyprus prison. Uh, she's currently a member of Europe's Family Ties expert groups. And she will be able to talk to us about how to prison balance children's needs and security and how this is put all together. Athena, the Zoom is yours. Athena, do you have the sound on? Just hold on a minute to... to yeah, hear. that's good. We can hear you. Yeah, I'm trying to... Um, flash it on the show. Um, hello everyone, uh, can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Uh, as I said earlier, the speakers, uh, you Vivian and Bende, and, and read some uh, chats. Uh, I'm sure we will uh, uh, inspire each other with ideas on how to make uh, the children's lives happier, uh, even during this difficult time. Um, as you can see from the contents of my presentation, I will be talking on three points. I will briefly explain how my department uh, supports uh, child parent relationships and how facilitate um, and support the contact of children with their imprisoned parents during three periods and before and during COVID time. And now with the gradual lift of the restrictions as from the 2nd of June. I'm sorry, and, uh, we don't have your PowerPoint for the moment. You don't. Not yet. Uh, oh, Brianna, do you have it? You can put it on? Maybe? Uh, can you put it on for me, Brianna? Yes. Just two seconds. Use them. We need help. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to um, continue, Athena, and then, and then I'll it put will, it. You will pop up. Okay. And you will catch up with me? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Let me know when you need me to change slides. Uh, okay. And, uh, <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, you will change the slides, not me? Yeah, yes. Oh, yeah? Okay, okay. So you have to tell me. <laughs> yeah, okay. And, 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 and finally, I will pinpoint on a few tips for positive results during COVID period in, in prisons. Can you change it? Okay. Uh, as you can see, we maintain a, human, a humane, a constructive open door regime. So this is from the beginning. Uh, I cannot see the... Oh my God. Is that good? Yeah. Are you seeing... Can you, can you move forward? Another one? To the next one? Brianna, can you go to the... 
uh, to this one, yes. Yes, as you can see, we maintain a humane constructive open door regime, which is embraced by human center uh, philosophy, aiming at the rehabilitation, resocialization, normalization, and smooth re reintegration of inmates in the society. Um, we implement concepts like the work life balance and the learning organization that facilitate personal development, normalization, and reintegration. And we provide many opportunities for contact with the outside world through physical visits and limited access to phone calls. Skype call visits, phone leaves, and transfers of inmates to attend family events. Uh, we also mm -hmm. allow um, children to join their imprisoned parents during several events in prison, uh, as well as outside prisons. Generally, we promote uh, positive parenting and we provide similar opportunities to those outside prisons in order to support as much as possible um, uh, ordinary family uh, relationships. Can you move on, Brianna? Yes, sorry for that. Uh, you can see some pictures in this slide from the life in prisons that support positive child parent relationships uh, from some events like Mother's Day, Father's Day, Children's Day, and some pictures uh, of our five visiting areas and uh, from the playgrounds prior to COVID. Can you move on, Brian? Yes. Um, as, from, uh, as you can see, the first COVID incident in Cyprus was on the 9th of March, and on the 10th of March, we started taking measures to prevent the transmission of the coronavirus in, in prisons. We promptly took preventative measures for inmates and newcomer inmates, as well as for uh, the prison staff and other staff that works uh, in prisons, and for any other prison who visits our premises, and we still maintain these measures uh, till today. However, it is important to highlight here that we try to maintain the open tour constructive uh, regime close to the ordinary one as much as possible. For example, during COVID period, the schools were not closed like the schools outside prisons, but they partly operated. Then gyms were closed, but all inmates had time for outdoor exercise to the football, volleyball, and basketball grounds as they were open from uh, early in the morning till late in the afternoon. And as regards the contact of inmates with the outside world and especially with their children, uh, this was a priority for our department as we support uh, positive child development. And uh, with the suspension of visits, we offered a variety of alternative, uh, uh, alternative means of communication for all inmates with their children, like um, a limited access to phone calls from eight o'clock in the morning until 8.30 late in the evening on a daily basis and Skype call visits uh, for all inmates. We also uh, provided uh, financial assistance for inmates in need, free telecards and other stuff like clothing, hygienic items and so on to cover their individual needs. We also, um, uh, also a psychological support was available uh, to inmates and to their families when needed. A protective equipment is uh, always provided by the prisons uh, to the inmates that are transferred outside prisons to courts and hospitals. And uh, finally, we managed to keep the COVID out, out of our prisons as we had no COVID incidents uh, for inmates or staff. Can you move on? Yes. Uh, as you can see, with the lift of uh, restrictive measures uh, as uh, from uh, the 2nd of June, we gradually returned to normality of things. Uh, schools and gyms went completely back to normality, but by keeping distancing and following uh, strictly the hygienic uh, rules. Further, uh, we still maintain the general protective measures for inmates and staff and for anyone who enters our premises. As you can see, the visiting areas reopened and physical visits are gradually restored. We have made readjustments uh, and, and have altered the interior space of our visiting areas in order to maintain face-to-face -face family visits, but still without the physical contact. Plexiglass separators have been installed in all five visiting areas. Um, Further, we continue offering alternative means of conduct for all inmates like we did uh, during COVID period. And the inmates who have children are allowed uh, more video family visits than the others. Can you move to the other? Yes. Uh, these are some pictures with the alterations in all visiting areas with the new interior and installation of a plexiglass separator. You can see some playgrounds with less and bigger toys than those you saw earlier, so it will be easier to disinfect before the next visit. Uh, in the middle of the slide, 
you can see a, 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 a physical visit, uh, as you can see, a physical visit is carried out with a plexiglass separator. As you can see, the visitors and the child uh, uh, wear the protective equipment that is provided by our department before uh, entering uh, our premises. Can you move on? And, and then here we reach the end of uh, my uh, presentation with some uh, positive uh, tips. A, a humane constructive uh, regime prevents detonation in prisons and lowers the risk for security. Uh, never take unjustifiably harsh measures to counter a threat without corresponding measures for restoration, as this can create a circumstance of frustration and unfairness. Balance and proportionality uh, principles uh, are key to positive results. Uh, it is important to support child-parent relationships in prisons by investing in learning and training of prison staff and by offering alternative means of conduct. Selected trained frontline officers can facilitate a child-friendly environment for children with imprisoned parents. My, my final point is that during COVID crisis, the availability of choices for contact of the children uh, with their imprisoned parents was golden for them as this met the needs of different ages of children. It is quite clear that alternative means of conduct cannot replace one another but evidently, and not the visits uh, with physical contact. However, this variety of choices for contact proved very restorative and, and very beneficial for different ages of children, as some children prefer video visits, some prefer talking on the phone, some prefer physical visits, uh, even by placing hands with their parents up against the plexiglass separator, and some love the combination of all alternatives for contact. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you very much, Athena. We can see that many of us don't have the chance of open up prison offices and prison services as yours, but it's interesting to see how to balance all these uh, interests that are different. I'm giving the word to Nuria Pujol. She's um, our friend Nuria from Barcelona. She works in Brands to Prison. It is a closed and semi-open male prison near Barcelona. And uh, there are 1,400 inmates in 14 units over there. She was the head of the Bryant to social work team for more than 10 years. And for the last three years, she has been working as a family participation manager, leading projects regarding how to involve families. So that's really interesting for us. So, uh, Nuria, we're giving you the Zoom so you can talk to us, especially about those screen visits and how you manage and what were the challenges there. The Zoom okay. is all yours. Okay. Okay. First of all, thank you for having me here to share my experiences with me, with you. and. Let's start with a brief account of our group of parental responsibility. The most important aspect of this group are its work methods and its composition, because it involves all kinds of workers, from officers to teachers and partnership, and also inmates, who are the most important of this group. We develop, develop uh, families activities in order to exercise the parental role. And these activities take place inside prison, as you can see in this picture. Or for instance, we do the football net program uh, of the football club uh, Barcelona Foundation. And their motto is no child left out of the game. And also, uh, we arrange family outings with the inmates who can spend some hours outside of prison with their families. And finally, <laughs> we take taking part in creative uh, workshops led by creative facilitators <laughs> and a partnership which is called Create Movement. Moving to the second part, uh, like all the European countries during the early days, our crisis commit always follow the recommendations of our uh, health authorities, implemented protection and preventive measures for workers and inmates. The main reactions can be seen on the Europris website. And first and foremost, in response to council visits, we look 
we look for a quick response which allow inmates to keep in touch with their loved ones as much as possible. And to achieve this goal, we call each family and inform them that we have to suspend all kinds of visits and implement a new system of video calls. We introduce a new approach to sending money and we use uh, the right phone line to give support and information. And we did uh, frequently asked questions. And finally, we assess all cases individually so as to be a pro proposed for early release. I can assure it was a hard time. Uh, during the COVID-19, our group of parental responsibility made some creative activities to keep in touch family and prisoners. You can see some of them in COPE's April newsletter. And we made a video address to families, a special letter for campaign, everything will fine, stay home. And last month, we were working to a creative stop motion. It allows inmates to send a message to their children by video call in a creative and dynamic way uh, from inside the walls of the prison as you can see in this picture. Moving to the third part, at the moment regarding visits, families have to follow the normal rules, visits, and plus follow the health and organization measures. We provide them with gloves and masks, and as a result of these measures, visits with glass screen can only assume, we can only assume the 45% of our usual capacity, and only three people per family when normally it is for four. However, the rest family visits, which take place in a room for each family, we can assume our usual capacity, but only three people per family when normally it is for six. So, two weeks ago, we reopened visits with glass screen, and the communication department were ready for 25 visits and about uh, 12 families came each day, but only six families to children. Yesterday, <laughs> we opened, uh, reopened the visits for family with children under 12 and the communication department were ready for 26 visits. 18 families came, but previous, previously, our group of parent, parental responsibility submits a protocol to clean all the didactic materials and select toys. We prepare again for children so as to follow the rules easily in the hall of the, the prison, as you can see in the pictures. And, and we gave some training to parents on how they explain to their children about how they have been experienced COVID-19. The main challenges are the prison work as normally as possible to a new normality inside prison. And for instance, start the intervention groups or start the workshop production. And regarding visits, now we are discussing video calls. And at the moment, they will like an extra visit. No, it's a normal visit. And, but we have, we have seen some families prefer video calls now because it saves time and money. And children are used to having on screen relationships. And also discussing uh, economic health for mobile data and vulnerable situation. I would like to finish my presentation with some proposals connected with making a screen visitors more child friendly. And last December, in an old prison in the center of Barcelona, which is now a cultural exhibition center, our creative facilitator with parents, inmates who are parents, made some proposals to make screen visits more friendly. Uh, but honestly, now, now this issue is not on our discussion because we certainly believe that the most important matter now is keep visit going and ensure security and health safety. Despite that, this picture could inspire you on for the challenge of future ahead. 
So uh, thank you very much for your attention and I hope I explained well and it, was, uh, it has been of interest to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nuria. That was really interesting. I have to say for my Swiss prison governors to see all these uh, pictures on the very nice and clean glass windows, <laughs> I love to get the reaction. That's, I will bring this on Monday um, <laughs> for next point. So I'm, I'm happy to introduce to you um, our friend directly from the States, Anne Adalis Estrin. She's the director of the Center for Children and Families of the Incarcerated in Rutgers. And we are very happy to have her here uh, for our last uh, presentation because uh, she will show us and underline the importance of support and preparation for all visits, but especially when visits are changing as they are for all of our families for the moment. So Anne, the Zoom is all yours. Thank you, Vivian, and hi to everyone. It's great to be back with you guys. It's, it's a really interesting um, response that I have to watching the other presenters. I think that um, there, there's you know, two points of view coming from the US, one which was reflected a little bit in the chat. <laughs> is don't look to us um, in terms of an overall picture of not replacing in-person visits because that's clearly happening in the US as things are um, moving toward technology. I'll go back to that in a moment. I think for, for me right now, I wanna look at um, the sort of why and the how of making non-contact visits child-friendly. First in the context of, for us, we've been focused on child-friendly in-person visits and improving that for the last decade because we don't have the kind of perspectives that you have about open and welcoming in-person visits. So we've been trying to improve that part and then COVID-19 hit. We've had non-contact visits in our jails, not in our larger prisons, but in our jails for decades. Um, just a, as a reference, the National Institute of Corrections in Washington is in the middle of something called the Family Connections Project. And it has one publication now on their website and a, we'll have another. Uh, we have a series of webinars and it is all about making visits child-friendly, both in-person and non-contact. I think I wanna spend a moment talking about what goes into that decision about not only making the non-contact visits temporary because of COVID-19 um, and how to help families with that as the, the other presenters have, have helped us to see, but also how to avoid what we're doing in the US, which is every time we make something child-friendly, the powers that be say, it worked so well, then why go back? And if you combine that with contracts that correctional services have with the technology companies, which indeed say, if you eliminate or, or, or minimize in-person visits, we will give you a huge discount on the technology for the other types of visits. Those visits are also paid for in the US by families. So the prison services get a discount from the technology companies, but the families pay for the visits. So I really want us to consider three things. What are the three things that people think of when they're trying to make this decision about how to do it and whether to do it and then whether or not to go back to something less restrictive? The first is always gonna be security. Um, and I think Athena talked about that a little bit and it's important to find the, the research that's clear about how much of a security risk um, in-person visits really are because sometimes one incident can be blown up to look like there's a lot of security risk. The second is finances. If, if it's gonna cost the correctional service less money to have non-contact or video visits, then they're gonna go for that. Um, trying to advocate that the families are actually paying for this is important. But the third, because I think most politicians and policymakers, they don't really want to say it's because of money or because of security. So they say that it's in the best interest of the child. And I want to, I want to stay there for one moment because who defines that? Um, when, when 
policymakers say that this is in the best interest of the child they're talking about, uh, quoting some of our research on that visits are traumatizing for kids. In some situations, it is because of the non-child non friendly nature of the visit. There's barking dogs, sniffing dogs, there's metal detectors. It is traumatizing. Um, but some folks have, have posited that it's not any more traumatizing than an airport. Um, it's, it's in the context though, of the people that take the children. So if, if people who are taking children to visit are uncomfortable and it's really scary for them, then it will be more uh, frightening for kids. But which is more traumatizing, not seeing your parent at all or seeing them in the context of something that's not quite child-friendly. Um, they're going to quote the, the trauma research. Also, people are going to say that, that that trauma research is based on the fact that children react poorly after a lot of visits. And again, they react at home, in school later, um, emotionally, more negatively after non-contact visits, according to our research, than after in-person visits. And so there's, there's a lot of conflict about the research and people wanna know what does the research say, which is more traumatizing um, and which is in the best interest of children. The policymakers are gonna pick out the pieces that say this is traumatizing so we don't do it anymore. We'll just let them do video visits and eliminate all of the in-person contact or non-contact visits. So it's, it's, it's important for us to consider who's making those decisions all of it in the context of, of popular opinion in the US, which is if you make it too child friendly, then it won't scare children enough away from going to prison themselves because we're constantly combating the myth that these are kids that are gonna end up in prison themselves. If you make it too child friendly, it won't be um, a deterrent, but if you make it not child friendly enough, it'll be too traumatizing for them. And so that debate rages um, on and on and on in the US. I also want to say that um, we, we put a lot of stock in interpreting what the kids and families say and as we should. I also though want to remind everyone that um, we should always keep asking children when they say they don't want to go because they, what they feel on this day may not be the same as the next day. Right now in the con context of COVID, they may say, I don't want to go because it's not the visit we're used to. Ask them again in a month or in two weeks or in three weeks. That's something that people say, um, okay, they said no, and then they don't go back to it, particularly if the carers are not comfortable themselves going. And that's the last piece of the sort of why that I wanna talk about, which is caregivers are really key to all of this and how they feel about the visit um, matters quite a bit. So now I wanna to switch to the how, because if we, if we advocate well for keeping in-person visits or going back to them after the COVID restrictions are lifted and advocate for child-friendly and implement a lot of these strategies. Um, what are some of the best practices? I want to share um, a document that will be available to you that Sarah Higgins, who's a family engagement worker from Bernardo's in the UK, called, uh, she shared with us creative connection ideas for visiting. And I want to call people's attention to a few parts to the, of that document. Um, the first two are theoretical. One is that, that Sarah talks about the glass as a barrier, but it could also be reframed as an object of playfulness. And I think that that reframe is important. The second thing that she talks about is that um, in, in many facilities, there have been play boxes on the child side, or perhaps also on the incarcerated parent side with things like books and puppets that could be used with the window, but they were typically used to occupy the child so the, the, the companion with the child could talk with the incarcerated parent. Another reframe is that they could be used for parent-child engagement, and I think that's really important. And the third piece that she raises is that the, in, the parent with the child on the child side of the glass could be the heart and the hands um, for the other parent. And so if the other parent is gonna say, I'm gonna tickle you, I tried this out with my eight month old grandson on video and it worked. I'm gonna tickle you and then the parent actually does it, They're, they can promote that, that connection. And I love those three points that she made. 
It also highlights how important that accompanying adult is. Um, and, and I think we really need to pay attention to that. On the document that will be shared with you are lots of brilliant ideas for things to do, activities. A couple that I wanna point out are, um, if, if there are puppets and books in that box, that's gonna to be tough right now with COVID restrictions and cleaning. Um, I wanna point out that bigger toys are easier to clean than all the small ones. But she also talks about having an art pen and somehow working on the, the, the hygiene of that so that people could, children could draw their parents face in the glass, but they could also use it to make a puppet on their hand or talk about a story with maybe one picture on their hand or on the glass. So even just an art pen, which could be easily sanitized, could work for that process. Um, I also wanna then think about so a few recommendations that sort of flow in a short amount of time from this uh, about policy, practice, and programming. The first for me is support, that all of this requires support for the child, the carer, and the incarcerated parent. Whether it's support around something new and different because of COVID or support around something that's going to go back to the way it was or to change drastically altogether. Preparing for that visit with all three parties is really essential um, for programming. The second one, I think, is training for the correctional officers. And we're doing a good job of that, I think, here. We're doing lots and lots of correctional officer training, not only on child development and what to look at and look for, and, but also on communicating um, how to talk to children, how to talk with the carers and the incarcerated parent um, in front of their child. And also training for community organizations such as yours in working with prison services. Um, that's been really popular because that, that's something that is, is essential. The second piece is um, of, of the sort of policy and program implications has to do with eligibility. And I think it's really important we're talking about kids in care versus kids not in care. I think that if, we're, if something's gonna change and child-friendly visits are going to be opened up when they haven't been there or something's going to shift, to start with, with children, for instance, whose parents were incarcerated for a crime against them or children who didn't know their parent at all before this visit is a, a bit of a recipe for disaster um, because I think that those could be very highly emotional, really difficult visits that if you're in a context of, of naysayers and negativity, they're gonna say, wait, this didn't work. Um, so thinking about what would the eligibility be for anything new that, that's being started. Um, also in the training for correctional officers, this idea of not using enhanced visits of any kind, either as a carrot or a stick, either as a you know, incentive to get them the, the incarcerated parent to do something or as punishment. And we see quite a bit of that, and that's embedded in our correctional training. And lastly, I think this, this has to be codified, that we have to find a way to legislate that, that in-person visits will not go away, no matter how child-friendly we make the other kind of visits, no matter how well it works for correctional services, it's the right of the child and the family to have in-person visits. Um, and I look forward to our, our small group discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anne. Wow, what a challenge. Four people, 45 minutes, we are almost on time. So thank you very much, all of you. I think it, it shows how difficult it is to just uh, say the world best interest of the child and that's it. And then practical way, what does it mean really? And where do you do this and how and with whom? And this is really interesting, your four point of view there. I think we all have many ideas in head and many ways of coping with that and questions. The idea now is to split, it will be magical. Zoom will split us in small groups and we will have a small 20 minutes to discuss in small groups with every group, a moderator. And magically, two minutes before it ends up, Brianna will say, pop up, you have two minutes and we'll all get back on Zoom. Well, welcome back. I, <laughs> and it's amazing. And I think it's almost as many people have come back as left. 
So that's impressive. It went very fast in that uh, oh, room. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The marathon. <laughs> Well, that is I'm sure. Well, it went quite fast, not in the little room, but we have tried to look at the comments that were made. And now we're hoping to um, have some, if it, is it one person from each room was going to post a final question to the, for the panel into the chat. So if they could do that, that would be fantastic. And while that's happening, we thought we'd just ask for a short a comment from each of the um, groups, just to see, and it could be about anything, and I'm sure you've worked it all out. So from Anne's group, maybe you appointed someone else to do that. <laughs> that was me. Great. Yeah, so um, I think for us, uh, kind of summarizing the conversation that we had, um, it was to kind of really pose about really examining best practice for um, visits for the experience of young children, but also children who have got additional needs as well. Fantastic. Really helpful. And then I'll put Thank the question you. in the, I'll type the question in the chat. Okay. And so for the, that's from Fiona. I feel if we collect them all together, then it'll be easier to share it round amongst the panel. So for, right. from, from Fiona's yeah. group. Yeah, we, we talked a lot around um, the, the video um, usage and, and kind of the idea of, of normalizing the use of a video, but with a very definite proviso of not replacing visits, but, but kind of mobilizing the benefits. So we liked the Tasmanian experience of the homework club, but, but also getting the child to talk about an activity or things that they can do with their parent in prison, and then using that, which has the benefit of both positive parenting for the parent in prison and, and real engagement for the child um, through those video visits so that it actually becomes a very much kind of child um, orientated and child kind of driven experience of, of, of having that kind of video contact, but that it should become normalized in addition to the other, uh, other forms of visits that children have. Well, that's, I mean, that's so interesting, isn't it? Winnie, your group, what did you come up with? You're mute, Winnie. <clears throat> You're, you're, you're mute. Yeah. I'm here, I'm here, sorry. <laughs> you hear me now, Kate? Yeah. Okay. Now we, we dived uh, into the uh, Ari situation and, and uh, uh, about what they do and uh, how that worked. And so we talked about the holistic way they work and uh, about um, how prison staff is, uh, uh, how decisions are made uh, around children into prison and together with the other social workers. Uh, but there was one question raising at the end and that was, um, yeah, how do other uh, countries uh, interact with children in care? So that was a special Bente uh, told us to think this through for Norway, but I think we could ask this question to the whole group. I think that's very, that's very <coughs> clear. And from Lindsay. Yeah, thank you. Um, so actually, again, looking at this back at the Irish situation, we um, were really impressed with, with what Teresa told us about the entrance to the prison and the thought that had gone into those statues and about how what a difference that could make in that really initial feeling for a family visiting, realising that there was some welcoming environment. And we talked about that, that an awful lot of thought goes into the the visiting space once you're in the prison but actually that could be really powerful getting the outside of a prison looking like somewhere where a family might want to visit yeah i mean yeah it was very powerful and i found and i think margaret tweet picked up on it it was that whole visit to calling it a sitting room all those and the yeah. parenting under pressure how we talk about it the framing is just Absolutely. so important. important yeah so so important and Michelle, did you have a group? No. You're mute. 
sorry, sorry. Um, yeah, sorry. Um, so we spoke about the voices of the children, and I think some of the speakers spoke really well about it um, in terms of um, what suits one child may not suit an, another child, and really um, looking at it from a children's rights perspective, and and also looking at. Um, um, supporting children during the time and children who may not have access to technology and support mental health supports for children um, and also then around I suppose we talked about um, rights parental rights more generally and in different contexts but breaches of parental rights and again like the importance of caregivers on the outside and then I suppose our final kind of point was about I suppose prisons that already um, already hadn't introduced technology and um, how it would have been so much more beneficial if our prisons were more progressive to begin with that um, that, that video in terms of um, ensuring that video calls can be implemented and I suppose policy and practice and I suppose it's about the learnings going forward that what we learn from the pandemic and how we can do things better in our in our prisons um, going forward. Fantastic, thank you. And the last group was Evelina's group, I think. Um, yes. Um, so we talked about um, a lot of uh, comments and ideas. And uh, one of it was how we started off uh, talking about that visiting prison is, might be a difficult experience for a child anyway. And then how g going on a non-contact visit, you know, that, that is even more stressful. And then how how to how do we talk to children? How do we explain uh, about non-contact visit that they cannot give the parent a, a hug? Um, but then we thought that we adapting. We've learned all of us. We've learned that we adapt to situations very quickly. And then maybe because some of the um, behaviors are removed from our environment and from our everyday life behavior anyway. So maybe that would be easier to replicate it in prison and maybe easier to explain it to children or maybe more understanding uh, for, um, for children. Uh, we talked about also supporting, as I think Anna was, uh, Anna was talking about it, supporting an accompanied adult as well. And because we said that very, uh, it's easier, um, easy to do by adults when there is no gains and no playing provided. It's easy to just switch to an adult conversation without acknowledging that the children are there and they might not be um, understanding this, the, the, the topic and then they might worry about it. So maybe coming up with some kind of leaflets or instruction to families how, you know, what it is to, to, to enter a non uh, non contact visit thank you thank you and vivian you had a group too didn't you yes sure don't forget us martha, no. is, our, martha is our speaker today i am i'm supposed to be the rapporteur as they say in the euro lingo um so yeah we had a, quite a lot of discussion about the um how the covid 19 crisis has been you know, forcing prisons and, 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 you know, and families and everybody to, to improvise and develop new ways of, 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 you know, ensuring these, you know, some level of visit and contacts could, could take place. Um, uh, and there's quite a, lot, quite a lot of improvisation, also quite a lot of creativity. But the question is, how do we, how can we make sure that, you know, the, children, the, ch the child's voice is being heard? Because they're the ones really to decide on, or what they prefer. Do they prefer in-person visits? Do they prefer video visits? And, and if it's video, under what kind of conditions? And, and the, the key question there is, how do we put the interest of the child, you know, foremost? I mean, I think it's just been so rich, this, all these questions and comments and the ones that we see here. And I find, what I find really interesting is maybe the first one that's put out by M Margaret Preetz from the breakout room two, which says, who would not be in, wish to be involved in drawing up a COPE guide briefing paper on the topics discussed, which in a sense was what came out throughout the chat in the first section that we certainly needed and COPE, I'm not, I'm not so much responsible now, but there will be 
there's these various strands of which came out in terms of children in care linking with Roma video visits um, and the decision and the supporting adult and how um, how the decisions are made and including children in making those decisions so I mean in a way I feel that that question almost doesn't need answering by the panel now because it's answered that that that's a, a job for COPE to do for the, for the future. I mean, I feel that. And in a sense, that covers what, what Martin's just said now. Um, but I think, because I think, in, and the element of choice that comes out so much from the questions. I don't know if someone, well, perhaps it maybe would be interesting to ask, um, our panelists, how they feel about ongoing, and particularly the prison people, how they feel it's possible to allow those choices, because it seems that that's what the children need, and how possible is that? So maybe if we started with N Athena and Nuria, that would be really interesting. Well, I think um, for us, um, bring uh, toys or some some notes or some uh, things inside prison. It's too difficult. But the choice between having a video visit and a and a screen visit, how possible is it for you to facilitate that? Now it's. A video visit, a video visit. You ask me. Now it's it's difficult to 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 do a video visit, but uh, we only can uh, do video call visits. Okay, only video calls, and we agree to do this video call as an extra visit, no a normal visit. Okay, and okay. and at this moment the the. Um, Communicate, communicate to the department, it's not ready to assume these uh, video calls or video visits. It's not ready to do that. Maybe in the future, but now we can do that. No, it's not possible for us. Okay. Athena, how, do, how would Cyprus manage the choices of a visit by a video or an in, or a screen visit or when it comes an in-person visit? Uh, we use Skype call visits uh, since 2015, uh, since January 2015. So we have a, an experience of five years uh, time, but we usually uh, allow the, the use of Skype for those that they didn't have visits and for those that they have children, they prefer the video calls. But from our experience, they, they prefer, especially uh, the children, the, the, the small ones, they prefer the, the physical visits with the physical touch with their parents, of course, and to play in the, the playgrounds, and etc. Cetera, et cetera. Uh, so what we did during the COVID period, we extended uh, the hours for the use of phone calls. It was up to six o'clock in the afternoon, and we made it for from uh, eight o'clock in the morning until 8.30 uh, in the evening on a daily basis, as we had before at six o'clock, but uh, uh, it's unlimited. Uh, the access to phone calls, it's unlimited. And uh, the, the, the difficult thing that we did now, but it was because of the uh, prevention measures, is to have these um, uh, visits without physical touch with the plexiglass separator. Uh, for us, it was... Um, it was okay to use uh, to have uh, choices of contact uh, for the children because we had also the phone calls from eight o'clock until six o'clock before before COVID. We had also the Skype call uh, visits and uh, we had also the ten uh, physical visits with physical touch uh, monthly uh, for one hour each visit. And for those that they had relatives abroad and then when they come to, to Cyprus. We allowed more time up to two hours, depend on the availability of the space. And, and so the only change just in our uh, prisons is that now we uh, implement the visits with the plexiglass separator actually. 
and we uh, reduce the number of, of, of visits. But this availability of choices for contact, it gives a balance uh, to the situation. And, and, and we didn't, thank God, we didn't have any riots or any uh, conflicts uh, as I saw in other prisons in Europe and outside Europe. So, uh, but we still um, think that we'll maintain also the extension for the use of phone calls. And uh, even if uh, it's okay, everything with the COVID, we will still maintain the, the use of phone calls with the extended hours. And of course, uh, the Skype calls, uh, these is were always available for our department. Thank you. Thank you. I, I've realized that we have people from Slovenian prison service. I don't know if you want to comment on this making, because it, what's emerging from the questions is that, is that people need the choices. And I just wondered how possible that is in Slovenia. Maybe Lucia, you can say something more. Uh, maybe Robert, you do it. <laughs> Uh, no, I can say that maybe in this uh, past period from uh, COVID crisis, we tried to implement um, Skype calls uh, for inmates, but uh, we did not manage because of, uh, because of uh, low limitation. But um, however, uh, we will try to do this in the future. So um, yeah implement uh, Skype calls and uh, give possibility to, to, to inmates to call home or to call anybody uh, via Skype and um, also change the, the law, so the rule uh, about uh, Skype visit uh, or Skype call. I mean, that is, it's really a problem, isn't it? When there's a restrictive law that, that doesn't, doesn't allow that. Hey, I, I wanted to, I would like to just remind people also in that decision about the choice, um, two things that, that have emerged in our group. One is that, in, at least in the States, half of our kids are under eight. So children, infants, toddlers, and preschoolers making that decision, no, whose, whose voice is it, you know? Yeah. And then the second piece is, because the, all of this technology costs money, when we ask the children, there's, it's creating some stress in families. Because if the children say yes, but the family can't afford it, and they, and you know, their their cell phone is disconnected or whatever, so those two issues of cost and age in the discussion of children making that choice um, are important. I think there's those are such relevant points and such such relevant points. I mean, I and I, I have know, something to uh, just to briefly. Work on. Yes, that'd be great. Yeah. Uh, about the choice and the decision about the choices, it's, it's, it's uh, I think uh, uh, those that they design uh, either the security measures or any measures in prison should uh, be human rights minded. Otherwise, they will design always the measure only from the perspective of, 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 uh, of the angle of the security of prisoners. They, they, they will, uh, and they will always outweigh the, the rights of the children uh, to the restriction uh, uh, to the restrictions of the security measures. So I believe that um, those that they design the measures should be human rights minded. Thank you. That's very strong from the from the prison service and really really valuable. I wondered if um, Bente, you and we nearly uh, do. Did you want to make a comment about this because you started it and something also I remember so strongly from Shirsty from FFP was she always said, well, it should be the children who choose when the time of the discussion is, not the, pri not the prisoner, because it may intrude in their lives. Well, we try to talk to children. It's important for us to always uh, listen to what they say. Uh, but of course, sometimes it's sort of through the parent. Uh, but we've just been talking at FFP now that we would like to, to make a new survey. We did so a few years ago to ask uh, about how the family's uh, health and the life situation is affected by imprisonment. But now we would be talking about sort of making it directly to children and not to parents answering on their children's behalf. I think that would be very interesting. 
but we have a lot of contact with children and we talk directly to them to get their opinions. I think that's important. And I guess that, but the issue that Anne raised, which I think is so interesting, is what we can ask the little ones, but we have to be really careful how that's done because effectively the decisions are made by the caregivers. Mm, yeah, that's the tricky one. Maybe just to add, this is often the case when you talk about participation of the child. That doesn't mean you tell me and we do exactly what you want. It's no. what is your feeling? How do you feel about that? What is your idea? And then take an adult decision and come back to the child and explain. So I think mm. this is different, hearing the child or making him or her have the decision. So this is really something very different. Yeah. And it's unfair on the child to have that responsibility. It underscores the importance of the support for the carers and the, and the parents, because they may make those decisions They include the child's input, but make those decisions solely based on their relationship with the incarcerated parent and their anger or their frustration, um, hearing the child, but not really including them in the decision. And we also have so many people who have multiple partners so they have children with, you know, incarcerated dads, for instance, who have two or three children with different mothers, and they have different decision-making processes in each family. This is really important that um, we, we hear children and that you have a point of view that is systemic. And when you work for the prison or for the mother or for the father, it's very different if you work for the child. And this is where NGOs are useful and uh, they add value to the, the prison staff and the different social workers because they can have another point of view where the challenge is only the child's best, best interest. And that helps broaden up the, the question. And that's how in Switzerland we can hear the mother or the father and both of them in prison and outside without having to choose for whom we're working, we're working only for the child. And that sometimes helps. I think that's absolutely right. Did anybody else who was on the panel want to, but Bernie, do you want to say something as a final sort of comment? Because I realize we need to wind up quite soon, but on the general issues. Yeah, I suppose it would be, it would be a practice always of, kind of ours um, from our family perspective in the project, working with families and, and children implicit in that and, and explicit in that, listening to, to their views and um, equally working with the social workers. So it would be very uh, core part for us, kind of the, the choice of the child, but equally the kind of the adult coming into that. And like one of the things we, we named and was named here in the prison by uh, Teresa was that our project would be called Through the Eyes of a Child because that was the sense that the decisions we make, um, whether it is even the colours we put on the wall, what would be, what's that like through the eyes of a child? And I think it's a very good guiding practice in decisions we make. Well, if, if you were looking through the eyes of a child, uh, what would you do in this situation? And um, I think that's a very good guidance for us. And I think for, for COPE, it's really where where we are, and I mean, I always remember Larry from Bedford Row saying, you know, when we were trying to d devise a mission, he said, children are at the heart, at our heart of our work, and that remains it. And I think that that's really clear. I'm conscious that the time is running on. So I, I mean, what's wonderful is that through the chat and through the breakout rooms and through these discussions, I mean, it's just been so rich. And we've also, I think what we came, the, the question that came from Margaret Tweed is who wouldn't want to be involved in taking this forward? So I, th I think Pope will take all these issues forward in some way or another. Um, but I feel that probably people have, we agreed when we discussed at the board, but maybe we shouldn't go on for too long today. So I'd like to pass on to Liz um, for the, a final comment and then to Lucy. Thanks, Kate. Yeah, I'll be really, really brief. Um, 
actually Brianna and I were kind of messaging back and forth and um, one kind of deliverable that we are preparing for 2020 is a thematic journal on, uh, on an issue that we select and obviously this is going to be our, our issue for this year and I can actually see the various chapters being spelled out already by the complex issues that have been raised um, throughout uh, the Zoom. Um, I think as well, uh, and, and also just uh, this would encompass the Irish yeah, experience as well as this discussion on visits, on video visits, protected visits, etc. So it, it's really all encompassing for the topics that we've talked about today. So we're really happy about that. Um, and just as an advocacy body, of course, um, we really recognize the urgency of taking these issues that were raised today forward, um, you know, to ensure that video visits do not replace in-person visits for children. Um, as Anne has said, has happened so many places in the US and they have, there have been attempts to codify this. Um, where are we in Europe with respect to that? Um, so Article 25 of the Council of Europe recommendation on children with in-person parents actually spells that out, you know, saying that information and communications technology should never be seen as an alternative which replaces face-to-face -face contact between children and their in-person parents. Um, so the recommendation is not binding per se, but states do um, abide by these recommendations. And if there are cases that are brought to the European Court of Human Rights, then the decisions that are made uh, will be binding. So this is, this is, there's a great potential for advocacy work and COPE is really committed to this. And uh, I, you know, I just want to spell that out. Also, this idea of promoting research um, on the impact of children of not, you know, touching loved ones as Anne highlighted, and not seeing them at all and seeing them on video. There's, there's not a lot of research out there about the impact on children of these various modes of communication. So this is something that COPE would really like to promote as well. Um, yeah. So we want to keep this momentum going and it's really been fantastic and thank you so much. So I'll hand this over to Lucy since we're short on time. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. Thank you, Kate. Thank you to everybody who's participated. I think um, it's been such a, an inspiring and a dynamic uh, afternoon. Um, the, the comments, the chat, the, the uh, energy that's coming from everybody, despite the fact that we are all so far apart, we feel I feel really connected to everybody and I can feel the energy that is coming and that's something that I think is we've always felt is very unique to, to the network, the, the energy that we get from one another, the inspiration, the ideas um, and as ever COPE and the members are coming up with innovation after innovation and I, I just want to commend everybody really for the work that you've all done. Um, in really extremely difficult circumstances. Um, I think what's come through today is uh, the, the, the power, the, the added value of multi-agency working. We saw that very, very clearly. We've seen that in the Irish model, the, the, the work in Norway, everything really we've been hearing about today, the, the value of the multi-agency work, um, the importance of allowing choice and not saying that this, one way is going to be the, the way forward for the future. We have got to have choice and we have got to have face-to-face um, -face visits and other options. I think there's been some very interesting comments coming up on the, on the chat about um, some of the added values, however, of, of the um, video or Skype call type visits, particularly for children and parents who are far apart, either geographically in their own country or particularly where the prisoner is incarcerated, not in their homeland, so foreign national prisoners, um, something we've often argued for, and maybe with COVID it will give us uh, now uh, an opportunity to introduce these um, remote visits in a more uh, systematic way. Um, I, I would like to, I, I was thinking as I was, as I've been listening to everything this afternoon, we've talked a lot about good practice and listening to the to children. But I think it's very, I think it's crucial that we take an opportunity to look to how we can evaluate the experiences of children and prisoners and indeed the carers, but particularly the children over the past four to six months um, before we start talking about what actually is good practice and what has worked. Um, I think all of us need to do that in, in, our, in our work and quite how that can be done and what the role of COPE should be in that, I think is a question that I will 
leave with with cope and the the board i think as everybody knows um i stood down yesterday at the general assembly as the president of cope i've been the president for seven years i've been on the board for 10 years kate philbrick as well has stood down as treasurer after um same sort of length of service as me she was also president for many years both of us are very um, sad to be standing down, but also very um, excited by the future direction that we see COPE and the members going in. We will not be leaving the network, we will be very present and uh, we will be coming to Leiden next year. We hope to see as many of you as possible in face-to-face -face in Leiden next year for the conference that, uh, and the, the ANM that have been promised. Um, there will be child participation in that. I noted Maria's comment that she popped up um, uh, about you know, children's voices. We talked about it a lot yesterday at the General Assembly. There are lots of ideas about how that will, will be and uh, certainly Exodus and our Dutch colleagues had, uh, uh, had everything planned for uh, child participation in the event that we were, were supposed to have been at uh, in, in Leiden. So um, I think really I just want to wish all of you well in your work. It's incredible what everybody is, is doing. Uh, it's fantastic to have this trans, not even just trans-European, but transnational communication. It's been wonderful to have Tasmania and the USA present today. And um, I just want to thank you all for participating on a Saturday afternoon and uh, to wish you all well. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, sorry. And to thank very much. I should have said I really we need to thank Liz and Brianna, uh, Carol and Noah in particular for putting this together because it's not been easy to put this event together really at short notice. And, um, and Kate too. And know, Kate too. I, Kate as well. She's really okay. been instrumental. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> and Kate. <laughs> thank you very much to everybody.